Well, it's a pleasure to be back. We've uh, had a few weeks off where we uh, had Holy Week and then Easter Week and all. And if you remember the last time we were together, which was the Wednesday of, of Holy Week, I had mentioned something about, about Good Friday, how one of the parts of the liturgy is an extended prayer for so many different groups. And I would just like to begin today because it situates to some extent where we've been and where we're going with these sessions. First of all, it prayed for the Holy Church that Jesus Christ gave us, which is in the creed. So in every Sunday and every solemnity, we say the creed and we believe in the church. The second prayer was for the Pope. How appropriate that it was only a couple of weeks earlier that we had a new Pope. And so we were praying for Francis on that uh, Good Friday uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Next, we prayed for all the Catholic faithful. And then we went to catechumens, those who were going to become Catholic on Saturday evening, the Easter Vigil. That group of people had a special, a special one of those 10 intercessions. And then we prayed for the unity of Christians. During the month of March, remember we talked about other Christians under the rubric of ecumenism. The next group we prayed for was the Jewish people. Now today we're going to begin by talking about the declaration on the relation of the church to non-Christian religions. The Jewish religion is a non-Christian religion, but there are others also. And so closely connected with the intention for the Jewish people, the very next prayer was for those who do not believe in Christ. So people like the Hindus, the Buddhists, Muslims, and other major religions in the world. Then we prayed for those who do not know God. Now, that we're really not going to get into over these 11 months, but there's a, 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 you know, the largest document that was put out by the Second Vatican Council is entitled The Pastoral Constitution of the Church in the Modern World. And they have selective issues. And one of the issues that's addressed in that particular document is the issue of atheism. But, you know, I can only do so much in 11 meetings and I can't do everything. So, you know, that I will just tease you with and uh, it may, uh, you know, inspire you to get that document and read that section. Oh, who knows, I may relent and talk about it too. So we'll see how it goes. The last two were for public office and those who are in need. So on Good Friday, from the earliest days of our church, these prayers became part of that celebration based upon the Catholic belief that Jesus Christ died for everyone. And on Good Friday, in a very particular, focused way, everyone ends up in those prayers. You know, it's not by happenstance, it's not by accident, it's faith becoming prayer. And the prayer 
strengthens the faith that Jesus is the Savior of all. And that's why everyone is included in that beautiful prayer, that extended prayer, on the day of Good Friday. But today we're going to begin this uh, session, and then next week, which will be just on the Jewish uh, uh, religion, because it gets the most attention. The, uh, the uh, de uh, de declaration that I'm talking about today is by far the shortest. It's very short. And yet, it's a major, major shift in the Catholic approach to mankind. The Church recognizes, as it did in another document, it recognizes the idea that the world has become a very small place and that in that smallness we are in contact with, we may well live in a society or country where there are major other religions than Christianity. And so the church is saying this is a reality now that faces us. I mean, for years, centuries, I mean, the church was not heavily present in certain parts of the world, and therefore the interaction with these other non-Christian religions was not as prominent as it is now. And therefore, it, you know, the church, which was founded to be a sign of unity, not only in faith, but also in humanity, bringing all people together because of what Christ did. And also, since God has declared his love for all of humanity, that the church cannot ignore humanity as if all of those other people have no connection to us at all. And so at the very beginning of the document, it states very clearly that we are here in this document focusing on what is common, not the differences. Now the church isn't saying there are not differences. The church is saying that there are big differences. But we're going to look at it, the church says, not me. We're going to look at it as to what is common. Let's build as far as we can on things that people can begin to dialogue and and to come to some agreement with, rather than a litany of things that separate us. So it's a positive beginning of looking at the face of religious people and non-religious people across the world. First of all, it says that there is a commonality among human beings. Men and women are men and women in, in Peru and, and they're Japan, and they are around the world. There's a commonality that we share just from our shared humanity. The church says that from our belief that all people are created in the image of God, that God is the origin of all life. Everyone may not agree with that, but the church's position upon which she develops her posture in, in conversation with the world is saying, we believe that we're all from the same creator. And not only are we from the same creator, but our goal is the same. Remember what I said a few moments ago, Christ died for everyone. And the church has said that it's not just believers, Christians, who are saved. So again, the church is, is taking this rather drastic shift in a very public way, uh, positioning herself vis-a-vis -vis other people. It then goes on to talk about People over the centuries across the world have been confronting the same issues. 
Who is a human? What is their purpose? What is the role of suffering in life? Why is there suffering? How do we handle evil? And the church says, no matter what religion, no matter what civilization, those are very basic questions that over the centuries have been, have been addressed by different areas, different thinkers, different backgrounds and cultures. Again, showing that there is much that brings us together, that we share the same concerns about what is the purpose of my life. Very fundamental questions cut across secondary dimensions very much. The church says that from the very beginning, from ancient times, each culture on its own tried to come to understanding those questions. They just weren't ignored, but they were faced, showing the you know, the desire to have some understanding. It then mentions Hinduism and Buddhism. Regarding Hinduism, it says that, that their history has been to contemplate the divine mystery and to express it to try to help people come to grapple with those list of things that I just shared. And Buddhism realizes that there's an insufficiency of this changeable world. There has to be more. And thus it teaches people how in a devout way And with a confident spirit, they may acquire a state of peaceful liberation, leading to supreme illumination. The church is not embracing that. It's acknowledging that. It's not that the church says, well, here's an alternative. No, the church isn't saying that. And we have to be very careful. What the church is saying that we need to understand what other religions are saying and to and to respect what their religion is without embracing that it is the same or a, an alternate to being catholic not this month next month when we get to the do, you know the declaration on religious freedom we will get heavily into that question because that became a major problem in the 70s and 80s. But we're still doing the groundwork now to get there. The church further says that other religions try to address the restlessness of the human heart. And of course, in Catholicism, we have that classic line from St. Augustine. Lord, our souls are restless until they rest in thee, O Lord. In other words, again, looking at the commonality. What do we have in common? And the church is saying, having studied other religions, that they also have recognized a restlessness, an insufficiency with the changeable world. There's more to life than that. Different religions come up with different answers. But the fundamental thing is the church is number one, saying let's stress and find those things that are common, which is a gigantic step forward. In 1986, in the 
the, you know, the uh, town, I guess they call it, maybe a city, Assisi. John Paul II invited all religious leaders from the world to come and pray, recognizing the commonality, a very, a very practical manifestation of what had been taught 22 years before. That now the Pope calls everyone, and, and as one would expect, everyone came. <laughs> and it was a major event that was um, you know, reported on across the world that religious leaders came together and they prayed for what was in their hearts Number one was peace. Number one was peace. From all the different religions that came, that was what was the common desire that all had. Now it's interesting, if you recall, the story about Jesus appearing to the twelve the night of the first day of the week. They were in the locked room and he said, peace be with you. And he said it twice. Again, the importance of peace. Now, from a Catholic point of view, from a scriptural point of view, peace is more than the absence of war. You know, Pope Paul VI said that in 1964 at the United Nations the first time a pope came to the United States, when he said, you know, we pray for peace and peace. And then he went on and said, and it's not just the absence of war, but it's an internal serenity and relationship with God. And so as the church continues in this declaration of the church's relationship, remember, it's not the relationship of other religions to us. They haven't come out and asked for anything or presented anything. The Catholic Church, once again, is taking the lead on behalf of humanity and inviting people enter into this discussion, enter into this dialogue, enter into the commonality of our humanity working together. And so what the Church did during the Second Vatican Council was something pretty radical. Other religions have their meetings wherever, and it becomes pretty much turned in upon themselves. Which one of our rules have to be changed, and which rules do we want to upgrade or downgrade? And I'm not making fun of that because we do it too at times, but the Second Vatican Council had another dimension. It opened up to the world. The church invited people to the conversation. The last paragraph, that, uh, the number in the uh, book, that I want to mention today before we then have questions and then get ready for next week with the Muslims and the Jewish people. The church says the church rejects nothing that has an element of truth or holiness. That you can find truth and holiness in other religions. And those are regarded with a sincere reverence as, as ways of conduct that again bring people closer together. So in other words, the church is not saying we have all the truth and you have none. Church isn't saying that. In this document, the church still says the church is the creation, the establishment, the institution of God. But that other religions have elements of what is true and what is holy. And those are to be respected and seen for what they are enriching individuals' lives on their journey. No one else has said anything like that. 
Other religions have not, I mean, they, you know, I mean, you really do have to be a worldwide religion to be able to say it. And the Catholic Church is, and it does say it and means it. Because the Catholic Church today has a special group in Rome, the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. Their job is to have dialogue with all the religions of the world. There's another group, the Pontifical Council for Ecumenical Affairs. They have dialogues constantly with other Christians. The Catholic Church is serious about what it means to say we're for unity. The Catholic Church is very concerned about unity and being the presence of love in the world to unite all people. So while this is the shortest little document in the whole book, it really is, it has some gigantic statements that had not been said before and have not been said by anyone else since. And the church still reflects on this and is in dialogue to try to keep those avenues of conversation open so that God's plan that all will be one will one day be realized.